Thank you for joining us for another of our investment manager presentations in the Quoted Data Around the World webinar series. Today I am joined by Ben Ritchie, co-portfolio manager of Dunedin Income Growth. Ben will be providing an overview of the company and the investment team's investment processes. I'll now pass over to Ben to take you through the presentation. Thanks very much, David. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present to you today. Um, I'm uh, one of the co-managers of the Needham Income Growth, as uh, David said, and I manage it along with uh, Sam Brownlee and, and Rebecca McLean. Um, the Needham Income Growth is one of the oldest investment trusts. I think it's the second oldest investment trust. It's been around uh, uh, since the early uh, 1870s and is uh, coming up to celebrating its 150th uh, anniversary. Uh, so it's been around a long time. It's been through ups and downs. It's been through uh, various guises. Uh, over the years, it started out investing uh, in uh, North American railroad bonds uh, in the 1870s. And today, uh, it's a portfolio uh, focused uh, on investing in a very uh, selective uh, choice of companies, mainly listed in the UK, but with 20% uh, of our assets invested in Europe, uh, looking to deliver a balance of uh, total return, uh, but also uh, a good level of income, and then also being able to grow that income uh, in real terms uh, over the medium term. And one of the really important things about need and income growth is that it does that within a sustainable and responsible investing framework as well. So it's that combination of total return, income, real growth and in income being delivered in a sustainable and responsible manner that we think sets the need and income growth apart within the UK equity income space. In terms of how we manage that, uh, we're able to benefit from having a very uh, big team uh, at Aberdeen, researchers covering the UK and European markets, particular expertise in small cap, uh, a very strong resource that we can dig into from a central perspective uh, in terms of ESG. That allows us to generate you know, a really broad set of ideas, which we can then uh, bring together uh, to produce the best possible portfolio for you. And in terms of our SRI approach, it's very much about positive allocation as much as it is about excluding things. So uh, we exclude about 25% of the market um, through our screens, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But then we're also looking to try and take advantage of companies that are both leaders in sustainability, companies that are providing critical solutions, uh, but also trying to engender change uh, through our engagement process uh, as well. And we're able to invest across the market cap spectrum. So we're investing in companies at 350 billion market caps, and we're investing in companies at 300 million market cap. So we're really looking to invest uh, across, across the spectrum. Uh, we also tend to run uh, pretty conv high conviction portfolios, uh, relatively focused in terms of the number of names. And we're very willing to be different to the wider market and to our uh, competitors as well. And what's the outcome of all of that? Well, the trust has a, a AAA MSCI rating, uh, as you might expect, given its SRI focus. We deliver a significant dividend yield uh, premium to the FTSE All Share, um, and we've delivered strong uh, relative returns uh, over the last uh, three and five years, and indeed uh, going back to the beginning of 2016 uh, when we repositioned uh, the trust itself. So what is it that makes uh, Digit different uh, to uh, its peers and the wider investment trust market? Well, we're very focused on total return. That's something that I think sets us apart. We've learned over the years that simply focusing on high yielding companies is not a successful long-term buy and hold strategy. In order to deliver attractive returns to investors, we need to focus on companies that can also grow as well as deliver uh, dividends to us today. And it's that balance of income today with the prospect of growth in the future that's very important in terms of delivering total return uh, over the medium to long term. The other thing that makes us different uh, is the embedded sustainable and responsible investing principles. So that's a set of screens that we put in place uh, that filter out companies that have risks uh, which we don't really want to take uh, over the longer term. And that's really uh, the big focus of our, of our SRI agenda, um, as well then as looking to make positive allocations to companies which we think can benefit from some of the trends uh, that are out there and utilizing our engagement skills to be able to enhance value at the companies in which we invest. And I think it's important to say that Dunedin is the only uh, UK equity income trust that invests with that uh, SRI overlay. So there are plenty of companies 
investment companies that you can invest in that, that don't apply that, um, but this is the only one uh, that does. And in terms of our positioning, we're very willing to be very different to the market. So we have high active share, high tracking error, willing to invest in mid and small caps, willing to invest in Europe, uh, willing uh, to take those long-term investment decisions. And that allows us to have a footprint that's quite different uh, to a lot of our competitors. From time to time, that may mean that we lag, but we think over the longer term, that gives us the potential uh, to meaningfully outperform as well. And it's the resilience of our income delivery that again has been very important for Dunedin. So uh, perhaps uh, as 2021 went on and we moved into 2022, investors were beginning to become uh, more relaxed about the outlook for growth and returns. But if we go back to 2020, when life was much more challenging, Dunedin's dividend income that it received from the companies in which it invests fell by around 10%. And that compares to a wider decline in the FTSE all share of about 40%. So the income delivery for Dunedin was much more resilient. And that goes back to that focus on total return and on that willingness to differentiate, that willingness to focus uh, on, on high quality companies as well as the underpin of our investment process. And it's that can allow us to deliver uh, consistent and sustained growth over the longer term. So how do we go about building a portfolio of about 40 companies from the opportunity set which we have? Well, when we look across the UK and European markets, we see at least 850 stocks which we could invest in. In fact, actually the number is probably more than that when we stretch out uh, into the companies that our smaller companies teams uh, invest in. We screen out about 25% of those uh, utilizing our sustainability criteria. And there are three elements to that. The first are formal screens, and those largely are excluding companies in areas like defense, uh, polluting areas within energy, um, and areas where we feel uh, that the prospects over the longer term may be undermined by the business model that can create the potential for stranded assets. We then also use our own in-house fundamental research and companies that get poor ESG scores on that, we also exclude. And then we also have a proprietary uh, internal rating system. And again, we exclude the bottom 10% of companies uh, in the market using that tool as well. And that overall excludes about 25% of the market. We then focus our attentions on the best quality companies that we can find in that universe. Uh, that leads a couple of hundred businesses that we can consider for inclusion in the portfolio. So roughly sort of 20% or so uh, of the wider market. And then we also, on top of that, look to add in some companies which may not be the highest quality, but which we think are good businesses, but that also offer us opportunity to access high levels of yield. So we do make some compromise at the margins to help us achieve our income target. The next stage then, is looking for total return. We're looking to back the businesses that our analysts rate as buys. Not everything in the portfolio will be a buy, again, because we need to manage uh, our income requirement, but the vast majority of the holdings, 80% or so, are going to be buy rated. So we're looking for companies that meet our sustainability criteria, companies that meet our quality criteria, companies that meet our total return criteria, and then we're looking to pull that all together to build a portfolio uh, of 40 companies uh, that can be that high conviction uh, portfolio that delivers both our income goals, our total return goals, and also meet our SRI criteria as well. So what does that look like overall at the portfolio level? Well, actively positioned, 41 holdings, 78% active shares, so pretty high for a UK equity income fund, around a third of the portfolio invested in mid and small cap companies. It's a portfolio that has greater resilience than the wider market. Better, more consistent earnings growth, better, higher returns, a willingness also to invest uh, in Europe, again, making that point of differentiation. And it's a portfolio that we aim to participate in the upside. So the upside capture has been pretty good, but importantly, resilient on the downside. So only taking around 80% of down moves in the market over time. And that's allowed us to deliver excess returns over market over the medium term. And how has performance been with the portfolio? Well, as you can see here over the last year, uh, it's been a tougher environment uh, for Dunedin. That's largely because the focus on higher quality companies has been somewhat out of favor. 
and sectors where we find it difficult to find both high quality and also companies that meet our SRI criteria, such as energy, banks, and mining, have performed uh, very strongly over this period. Nonetheless, over the year, portfolios delivered positive NAV return. Um, and over the three and five years, the performance of the portfolio remains strong and good in both absolute and relative terms. And as you can see here, the share price performance has exceeded that uh, of the NAV. And I think that's because investors uh, have come to quite like the way in which we approach the investment and also have bought into the idea uh, that the focus on uh, the SRI approach uh, is the right way to go for the portfolio. And again, that does differentiate Digit within the wider equity income space. But if I go back to some of those uh, past years, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, in tougher market conditions, such as in uh, 2020, 2021, you know, the portfolio uh, has generally performed uh, pretty strongly. And that's, uh, you know, important to us uh, overall in terms of what we're trying to deliver as a return journey. So again, to add a little bit more color uh, on our sustainable and responsible investing approach, um, I think emphasizing very much uh, the positive allocations so really looking to put money to work in businesses where we think they are both leaders in their area, but also uh, have the opportunity to provide uh, solutions that can take advantage of many of the challenges which we face uh, from an environmental or social perspective. Again, we're identifying those uh, utilizing our extensive uh, analytical resources uh, to be able to do that. And then we have a series of active exclusions, uh, which we apply as well. Uh, firstly, through the screens that I've already mentioned, uh, but then also through our ESG house score and also through uh, the ESG quality score that our analysts apply as well. And we're able to generate additional insight uh, to help us in that process, both with collaboration through other asset classes, such as our real estate team, our REITs team, uh, uh, also our credit team, um, and then also being able to borrow the expertise uh, which we have centrally, we have a very significantly resourced central ESG team that are experts in areas like voting, engagement, and policy. And they, again, are able to help us in terms of implementing uh, our approach. To, to put a little bit more uh, meat on the bones of, of what we're uh, looking to do, all of the companies which we have within the portfolio uh, are classified either as, as sustainable leaders offering leadership solutions or uh, as improvers. Improvers, generally speaking, are companies where the ESG uh, quality is a little bit lower uh, than average, but where we see opportunities to improve that. And that's where direct engagement uh, with the companies in the portfolio uh, becomes uh, very important. And we have an ongoing program of engagement, priority engagements uh, with those companies to help achieve the goals which we set out that if we believe can be achieved, can uh, importantly, not only make the companies better businesses, but also enhance the value of those companies uh, to the end investor as well. And in terms of the footprint uh, of the portfolio, you can see uh, at the bottom there that the portfolio uh, rates uh, very highly. Uh, and we're, we don't use uh, MSCI internally as an allocation tool, but we're utilizing it here just to show you uh, the profile. Uh, of the portfolio. So uh, a lot of assets, 75% uh, of the assets in companies rated as leaders. I think importantly, no assets invested uh, in laggards and an overall uh, high rating uh, for the portfolio. And again, as you might expect, you know, the carbon intensity, the carbon footprint uh, of the portfolio, uh, much uh, lower uh, than the wider market as well. And again, I think that's an important part of what we're trying to deliver overall. And while it might well be that from time to time, uh, energy and mining can perform very strongly, indeed performing uh, very well today, you know, we do believe that there are some quite significant challenges that need to be met for some of these sectors over the longer term. In terms of our positioning, you know, what does that all lead us to uh, at a sector level? Well, it tends to mean that we allocate most of our capital to areas where we can find higher returns, more sustainable, visible earnings. And that takes us to areas like healthcare, uh, technology, uh, and to some extent, we like the reliability and consistency that we can find uh, in both utilities uh, and real estate. And we do have a big overweight to financials as well. It's worth saying though, that that's a very broad 
area it encompasses uh, banks, asset managers, stock exchanges, uh, uh, as well as a, a range of different uh, insurance companies as well. So it's a very broad uh, exposure that we have uh, within that space. In terms of our uh, market cap range, you can see we are significantly underweight uh, the FTSE 100, overweight uh, mid uh, and small caps. And then uh, our 21% non all share exposure uh, is primarily our European investments. And those investments in Europe, by including the European market in our uh, potential opportunity set, you know, we more than double the number of companies uh, that we can think about investing in without completely diluting our approach by perhaps allocating that 20% uh, on a global basis. And it really helps us do three things. Firstly, it helps us find companies which are just great businesses. There are some phenomenal companies and we can invest in those. It also gives us the opportunity to find companies that do things that you just can't find uh, in the UK market. And then it also gives us the ability to either diversify or make alternative choices uh, from an income uh, perspective as well. So it's very helpful in terms of improving and delivering the mix of companies which we have within the portfolio to meet both our SRI criteria, uh, but also our total return and income criteria as well. From a positioning perspective, on the right hand side, you can see that we are broadly split about a third, a third, a third between leaders, solutions and improvers. Uh, the improvers piece, you know, again, uh, overall about 35 to 40 percent of the overall portfolio. Those are the ones uh, which we're going to be looking to try and engage with to improve their overall uh, ESG performance. But again, that allocation to leaders and solutions fits nicely with the leaders uh, that you saw earlier from the MSCI data. In terms of our uh, absolute positioning, again, you, know, you can see a spread of assets that we have here uh, within the portfolio. Uh, companies uh, that we like tend to be businesses with strong uh, uh, business models, uh, good visibility in terms of their earnings uh, and revenues, and capable of either paying a high yield and sustaining it and growing a little bit, uh, or uh, companies where the yields are lower, but where we've got a lot of confidence in the delivery uh, of those dividends over the longer term. So looking at the names we have here, companies such as SSE uh, or Nordea uh, or, or Chesnara, you know, those are businesses with high yields where we would expect relatively modest growth, but growth nonetheless in terms of the dividend distribution. And we don't like to buy companies where they've just got a high yield that they're desperately clinging to. We want to have companies that can also grow uh, those dividends uh, over time. So that's going to be a really important part of the total return story. But then we've got companies such as Diageo, AstraZeneca, Relex, Prudential, Intermediate Capital. You know, these are companies where the yields are not desperately high today. They might be two, three percent perhaps, uh, but where we have confidence that we're looking at five, six, perhaps even 10 to 15 percent uh, dividend growth. And that's going to be an important part uh, of moving the dividend ahead for the trust overall over the longer term. And what does that all mean then for Dunedin uh, at the bottom at the bottom line? Well, we've been able to maintain or grow our dividend uh, over the last uh, 39 years, and we've been through some ups and downs uh, over that time period. Uh, the yield today of 4.3%, so well ahead of the FTSE all share, and I think that's nearly a 20% premium to the to the wider market. Uh, the dividend last year raised a little bit, uh, I think reflecting. Uh, the challenges of, of, of the COVID year. But as I said earlier, you know, dividend income was down, uh, but much, much less than the market. And that's where our revenue reserves are very helpful. So we've got uh, nearly uh, three quarters of one year's worth of, of dividend reserves uh, remaining on the balance sheet. And those are helpful to enable us uh, to you know, support the dividend in years where perhaps you know, the earnings delivery falls short. But it's also, I think, important to help us uh, make the transition which we've been doing over the last five or six years from a, a very much a focus on high yield to a focus on total return and balance between income and growth. And in certain years, we've tapped into our dividend uh, revenue reserves to be able to help uh, move the dividend uh, ahead. And we pay that dividend uh, on a quarterly basis to our shareholders. In terms of our income generation, looking into next year, and it's worth saying that this is a forecast rather than a guarantee. Uh, but you can see here 
that the income uh, generation is fairly well spread amongst our top 10. We have about just over 50% coming from uh, our top 10 holdings. And again, I think what's interesting about this is that these companies are you know, perhaps a little bit different uh, to that which you might see uh, from uh, you know, a, number of other, a number of other managers. Uh, and again, that's something which we're, which we're quite com comfortable with. And when we look to these businesses, you know, we're always very keen that if we do have those high dividend yields, that they are at the absolute minimum uh, likely to be uh, sustainable, uh, uh, but also ideally capable of being uh, grown ahead. And one that perhaps it's worth pointing out here will be Glaxo. You know, they've already announced to change their dividend policy from a few years ago. So again, they won't be one of the ones within this portfolio offering uh, a higher yield uh, going forward. But we see good, steady growth from the likes of Assura, AstraZeneca, uh, Direct Line, uh, Nordea as well. In terms of what we've been up to in 2021, most of what we've been doing from a, a change in the company held has been driven by the SRI framework adoption. And that meant that we had to sell out of tobacco and our mining companies because of their, of their cold exposure. Uh, and also because uh, in the case of Rio, because uh, of, of, of some of the other uh, aspects of the business. Um, and we also uh, sold out of National Grid as a result uh, of some elements of its carbon intensity. On the other side of that, uh, we've invested in Persimmon, a house builder, Nordea, uh, the Scandinavian bank, and Volvo, uh, which is the Swedish listed uh, truck maker, as well as Moonpig, the online card retailer. You know, Nordea, Persimmon, and Volvo all pay relatively high, and we think uh, sustainable uh, dividends, compensating for the income which we lost uh, on the other side of that. And businesses, again, which we think you know, offer comparable uh, levels of quality, if not perhaps slightly better. Uh, again, similar perhaps levels of, of dividend growth, um, but doing it in a way that meets our sustainable and responsible investing criteria. I think it's important as well uh, as an investor in the UK uh, to make the point that the opportunity set in the UK is a lot more exciting than just thinking about UK GDP. The UK market uh, has about 75% of its revenues coming from overseas. And that presents opportunities um, uh, for investors. And when we think about our portfolio, you know, we see some really big trends out there that are gonna support growth for some of these companies for many, many years, um, and which have got the potential to deliver you know, really attractive returns uh, to investors. So whether we, we're thinking around some of the big consumer trends out there, um, the uh, ability perhaps uh, of people to buy uh, their pets, something that's been uh, really accentuated uh, by COVID. Um, and again, a, a trend which we think is here to stay that plays very strongly into the likes of Decra Pharmaceuticals that provide um, uh, drugs for uh, companion animals or a company like uh, Croda, a speciality uh, chemicals manufacturer, again, uh, providing biosurfactants uh, biochemicals uh, being produced in a much more uh, environmentally friendly way than traditional chemicals and, and being uh, applied to a wide range uh, of, of consumer products. And again, you know, Crota really benefiting uh, from the growth in that marketplace. In terms of demographics, again, that's a driver both of aging populations in the West and to some extent in Asia, uh, but also uh, the broadening and widening global population. So a company like Prudential, very well placed to take advantage of the savings need across the Asian markets in which it has such a strong position. Uh, or a business like AstraZeneca, leading uh, in research and development uh, for oncology. Again, able uh, to really push uh, the boundaries uh, of, of science in terms of the solutions uh, that it's providing in that area. And then the shift in terms of digitalization is also a big opportunity. And the UK is known as a market that doesn't have a lot of technology uh, listed in it. But actually, you know, there are quite a lot of companies that can really benefit from that shift in digitalization, even if that might be something like the London Stock Exchange, which is primarily today becoming a data-driven business, or in the traditional uh, space, something like Aviva uh, selling uh, software uh, into the industrial uh, and markets, primarily around shipbuilding uh, and other large uh, projects. One of the things that we also get from our European exposure is the ability to invest into some 
more interesting technology companies and a business such as ASML that makes the machines, that makes the microchips that power the global economy with a real uh, almost monopoly position in that area, you know, is a good example of a company that's very well positioned for the long term. And when we think uh, perhaps more specifically about the attractions of the UK market, well, they really have come in a number of areas. I think firstly, the UK market does trade at a big discount, as you can see at the top left, versus uh, its global peers. So, you know, the UK has not traded uh, this cheaply uh, in, in, in recent history. Uh, it's a market that traditionally has always been on the cheap side, but the, the, the relative attraction of UK equities versus their peers globally from a valuation perspective uh, is, is definitely striking. On the other side, you know, the UK also has a lot of really fantastic uh, mid-cap sized companies. And you can see here that the performance of the uh, FTSE 250 has been very strong. Uh, over the longer term. And it's an area where we really do like to allocate capital and we can find some fantastic businesses uh, to support us over the longer term. And again, you know, I think one of the things that attracts investors to the UK uh, is its relatively open uh, and broad-minded uh, uh, sort of corporate governance setup, which again does allow uh, M&A transactions within the UK market. And the attraction of those really good companies, the discounted valuations, uh, and the open market framework has certainly meant that we've seen uh, a lot of deals happening uh, across the market in 2021. And that's something which we would expect to see more of uh, as we go through the year, as investors look to take advantage of some of those discounted valuations and attractive growth opportunities. So in summary, you know, we think that Dunedin income growth is well positioned uh, to manage uh, the challenges ahead. Uh, since we put this presentation together, we've had the tragic events uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, that's going to pose a lot of challenges uh, for investors over the coming uh, weeks and months. One of the things that which we're very focused on uh, is the sustainability of the income generation, the robustness of the balance sheets of the companies we invest in, uh, anchored within that sustainable and responsible uh, investing approach. And we think that that focus on high quality, sustainable companies is something which can hopefully stand us in reasonable stead, even in what are likely to be difficult uh, market conditions. That exposure to companies from across the market cap spectrum in the UK and Europe will also give us the best opportunity to find the potential things that may come out of this uh, that can help power uh, our performance uh, over the longer term. The resources which are able uh, to call upon in the management of the trust are also extensive. That integrated ESG approach in our investment process, again, is very important. The analytical base that we have in the UK, Europe, and smaller companies is critical, as is the central ESG resource that we can draw on. And what does that all mean uh, at the end of the day? Well, it means a portfolio well aligned uh, to sustainable investing principles, lower carbon footprint, higher ESG rating. We believe lower levels of risk that can deliver a better risk adjusted return to you over the longer term, coupled with that active engagement agenda that we believe can add significant value. It offers a premium dividend yield well above the market with consistent and sustainable income generation and a belief and a desire to grow dividends in real terms over the medium term and a portfolio that has a track record of delivering strong total returns over the last three and five years. And that's really, uh, we believe, the opportunity and the attraction of the need and income growth. So thank you very much for your time today. That's great, Ben. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, thank you for that. It's a very useful overview on, uh, on the need and income growth. And it's very interesting to hear about the SRI criteria and how they're embedded into uh, the investment processes of the managing of the fund. Um, well, I would like to thank everybody for um, uh, for viewing this uh, presentation, which is uh, part of our Around the World webinar series. Please look out for other recordings on our website, QuotedData.com, for the other video presentations within this series, which are available on our events videos page, and also, also through our YouTube channel. Thank you for now.